Welcome to this tips and tricks video for Spell Siphon. So today's video is going to be about some more advanced stuff that you can do with the mod. So this is stuff that isn't in the tutorial explicitly and not in the books. This is more stuff that you would uh, figure out on your own during gameplay. But I'm here today to help you figure out some more stuff because not everyone will figure out all of the stuff by, their, by themselves, of course. Uh, and I, myself, have not figured out everything you can do with this mod. So with that, I also want to say that please do leave comments on this video. If you have your own tips and tricks that you want to share with other people, then please do so. I am also super interested myself in hearing your use cases for the mod, hearing how you have like bent this system around your own build and found your own ways of playing with it. I'm very interested in that, so so please do comment if you have anything uh, to add here. So um, I have set up a test character. Just want to mention that I have a thousand magica, even though I'm level one, because I wanted to. It was practical. It's practical to have some magica so I can cast any spell I want. I've also used the Simply Balanced mod to decrease my own damage taken to 0% so I can't die. I know I could have used Toggle God Mode instead, but God Mode also gives me infinite magicka, which I didn't want. So I've used this method instead. Uh, Simply Balanced, a mod I can otherwise greatly uh, recommend. It's a great mod for granular control of your balance, if you want to set up your balance uh, yourself. In any way, it has lots of details that you can configure if you're interested. Anyway, so the contents of this video will feel to some extent obvious to some people. Uh, it will also repeat some of the stuff from the very old, very old tutorial video from back in 2019, I think. Uh, because that video is so outdated, I don't recommend anyone watch it anymore. But there was some content there that is still relevant, that I will repeat here. Just to have it as part of an actually relevant video. So those that have watched that may see some stuff that they already have before. But I expect everyone watching this video to at least find something that they didn't know about. I also want to mention that I am using a different microphone for this video compared to my old ones. The pro with this new microphone is that the sound quality is a little better, or a lot better. The downside uh, is that it picks up everything that's happening in my room, including my mouse clicks and my keyboard clicks. So hopefully that won't get too annoying. <laughs> um, also, I finally want to mention, before we get started, that I will be going through things in the same order as the unlock system in the game. So I will start with the basics that you can do with your draw and ward spell. And I will then go into the research settings that you also get from the very beginning. And then I will go into the weak binding unlock, uh, which is the first book that you can uh, unseal. And then I will go into Discharge, and then into Binding 2, the Empowered Binding System, and finally into the Animation System. The intention here is that if you haven't played with the mod long enough to uh, unlock everything, then you can just follow along in the video until I get to the section where you don't understand anything anymore. And then you can just jump off there and come back later when you've gotten to that unlock section yourself. So, intro out of the way, let's get into the actual content. So, you start this mod with the draw and ward spell. So what can you do with these? Well, to begin with, I wanted to just mention that uh, since a few versions back, there is now a presets page in the spell siphon MCM menu. This is not available for Xbox users, of course, because you don't have an MCM, <clears throat> but you can replicate the same settings that these presets apply uh, on Xbox as well. It's just a little more cumbersome to do. 
but I wanted to mention this. Uh, so the presets menu allows you to pick out a part of spell siphon to use without having to use the full complexity of the system. I know a lot of people feel that spell siphon is very complex. It has a lot of features and it, it does. It does. It has a lot of depth and a lot of features to understand. And if you just want a single part of spell siphon, then this is the page for you. Because this allows you to, for example, grab only the word spell and nothing else if you want to. Uh, and it will disable all other features. It will also explain exactly how you access the word spell here in the details. If you want just the imbued weapon wording system that allows you to play a spell blade in a much more practical way, then you can do that. If you just want the bound weapon system that gives you two extra weapon sets that you can access without any hotkeys, that scales with your health bar, uh, instead of being this OP bound weapons from the beginning, then useless bound weapons at the end game like the normal ones are. These are special bound weapons for this mod that have a scaling system. If you want just those, you can get those here. And there's this combination option where you can get both the ward and the weapons and nothing else. So that's nice. Uh, there's also this setting. Uh, if you like Spell Siphon as a whole, but you find that the ward spell is too powerful, or you like using shields, or you like using the vanilla ward system, then you can do that too. You can disable the ward part of Spell Siphon without touching anything else. So the entire rest of the mechanics are still intact, you just don't have the ward spell. You can do that if you want to. Right, with that out of the way, let's look at Tron Ward. So the first thing is something that I went through in the old tutorial, but I wanted to mention it again here. And that is that when you're drawing uh, your world element, you usually shoot at the ground, right? You shoot at nothing. You can shoot at the sky, but you shoot at nothing. And that can feel like a bit of a time waster, right? You're in combat, every second counts, and you're spending time shooting at nothing. Maybe you actually want to shoot at your enemies, even though you also want the, words, uh, the world spell. Well, you can do that. I'm gonna spawn a Draugr here. There's a whole lot of Draugrs. But yeah, there's one. I'm gonna spawn Mr. 000 EB C2C. There we go. Now, if I want to draw life, of course I just draw it straight from the enemy. He takes damage, you can see the health bar moving. And I got my life spell, so I can cast that out. But if I draw a world, I'm not doing any damage because I need to shoot at the ground. So the tip here is that you can start drawing off target and then pull your draw onto the target. So now I still did draw damage to him, but I also got my world spell as I wanted. So start off target, move onto target, that way you get the draw damage, but you still get world. Off target, on target, and he dies. This can also feel a little better. It's kind of like having a light sword in it, you like slash onto the target uh, to attack them. Uh, so that's, that's a trick from the old video, but I wanted to bring it up again. Accumulation is another mechanic that you learn about in the tutorial, and it's basically saying that if you draw with your ward up, you will extend your draw. Draw usually lasts for one second, but if you have your ward up, it will last for four seconds, giving you much more time to aim. But if you draw for the full four seconds, then the draw will break. So you usually don't want to do that. Anyway, what I wanted to add to this basic mechanic is that there are visual and audio cues to help you use the system. So when you're drawing an accumulating world, you will see this fire effect. And that one you have probably noticed, 
But I also wanted to say that the other elements have an effect as well. So if you draw and accumulate ice, you will get this ice effect on you. And these will also switch during the accumulation process. So if I start accumulating world, and then start accumulating death, then the fire will switch into ice. Let's look at that again. It's fire, and then it switches to ice. So there's a little ice effect that happens on my arm there, and there's a freeze-up effect, a sound effect, that you can hear when the element switches. And this is a nice indicator for you to know when you can let go of the ward and still get your intended element. So you want the death, but you start in the world, you hear this little freeze-up sound, and then you let go of your ward. And now you have your freeze element. Can be practical. General tip as well is that you should always have a summon. When you're playing with spells, I greatly recommend that you have something that you can draw life from when you're out of combat. Of course, if you're playing with followers, you can draw from them. They may get a little mad at you, but um, you can draw from them. But if you don't play with followers, like I don't do, <laughs> then a summon is very good to have. So. You can, when you're out of combat, just summon up your wolf here, and you can grab the life from that one. And that allows you to, for example, attune yourself, so that when you enter in the next fight, your weapon is attuned to life, and you can start with the life discharge, for example. You can also use it to reanimate an enemy after a fight, so you have that one ready for the next fight. You can combine the two, that was a nice backflip. <laughs> you can combine the two things, so you use the life element to reanimate, and then you summon up your weapon, so you have that attuned to life as well. And then you walk over to the next fight, and then maybe you want to open that fight with a rift arrow. You can do that too, just turn around, find your summon, hit him, that will destroy him immediately. You get your bow, and you can fire your rift arrow. and start the fight like that. All that possible because you had a summon. So yeah, very good to have. It also allows you, of course, to mine life. But now we're getting ahead of ourselves. So let's move on into the research book. When you start with Spell Siphon, you not only get Ward and Draw, you also get this pretty advanced research book with a lot of settings. And the reason you get all of this complexity at once is because everyone likes to play Spell Siphon differently. And I don't want to limit your options uh, from the start. I want you to be able to configure the mod exactly as you want it from level 1. So all of this is available immediately. Uh, however, it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff to learn, of course, and the tutorial helps you do that as best it can. Uh, but I wanted to go through some tips and tricks with this. I'm going to start with Entangle and mention something that is mentioned in the long documentation on the page, but not in game. And that is that you can entangle spells with just one element and keep the other elements unentangled. So, for example, if I activate Entangle here, and I entangle Lightning Bolt. There we go, now the Life Weave has been altered, so I have a new spell entangled with life. Now when I draw life, and I fire it, it will be the Lightning Bolt, instead of the normal life spell. However, if I draw World, the world will still be the standard spell siphon magicka free world spell. And the death draw will still be the standard spell siphon magicka free death spell. So through this method, you can have a combination of magicka costing entangled spells and magicka free spell siphon spells without having to use this realign power. Of course, realign is the more flexible option. If you have a hotkey free to be able to link this up, 
then do that and use that power because it's more flexible. But this is a way to do it with less hotkeys. So you can, for example, then, I'm gonna take out my wolf again. You can draw life and you can use that to empty your magicka bar. I have 1000 magicka now, so that's gonna take a while. But yeah, empty out your magicka bar and then when you're out of magicka, just draw a different element. Draw world or draw death. And you can keep fighting with those magicka free elements uh, while your magicka is regenerating and then start drawing life again uh, once you have the magicka to cast that. If you happen to draw life and you're out of magicka so you can't cast it, then you can also either dump the element through using rebalance then you're back to draw. So you can draw the mana free element that you wanted. Or you can use bind. That's also an option. Draw in life. Instead of casting it, since you can't because you don't have enough magicka, bind it. Then you will transition to death automatically. And death is free. So you can cast death instead. Pretty practical. This, of course, only works with life because life bind is the only one that transitions the element into a different element. So if you're going with this playstyle where you're mixing magicka costing and magicka free spells in entanglement, I would recommend you put the magicka costing spell on life because it has this nice feature of uh, transitioning uh, with the bind shout. Uh, right, so the next thing uh, when you're summoning weapons, when you're summoning weapons, and this is something you get with the initial binding unlock, this one, um, it looks like this, right? Summoning a weapon. And then you can switch weapons. You can use a power to switch between different weapons. So I will take uh, but I will take reverse here and uh, hotkey that to one Wait, if I press one I will switch into my optional weapon which is currently sent to the life foci uh, or foci however you want to pronounce it um, the tip here is that if you immediately want to go into your secondary weapon, instead of having to summon the sword and then use the button and then go to into your second weapon. Let's say you want to go immediately into your secondary weapon. Then you can press your one hotkey immediately after the summon. So I press bind first to summon, and then I press one. And I go immediately into that. So I interrupt the animation of the sword summon and go immediately into my secondary summon. And this works because I have enabled the focus setting. So that's something I recommend pretty much everyone do. Go into focus and power and shout focus and use one of these. Either auto casting spell siphon powers or auto casting all powers. I'm gonna go for all powers here. Uh, because that allows you to do stuff like this. Summon your sword, press the hotkey, and you're straight into your secondary weapon. Very practical. Alright, now that we've talked a little bit about powers, let me also talk about shouts. So this mod uses bind as its base button for a lot of stuff. Uh, bind is this very flexible shout that does a lot of different things in mod. Uh, but you may want to use other shouts. You may want to use your vanilla shouts, because shouting is very central to Skyrim and it's very interesting. So, uh, when you're using a shout, you get a cooldown, right? You get a cooldown that you can see up there on the compass. And you would expect this to prevent you from using Spell Siphon's Bind Shout, because that is a shout as well, right? Well, the mod sends a few versions back, actually has a mechanic to fix this. 
So you don't need the individual shout cooldowns mod or anything like that. You can just use spell siphon and the way it works is that if I use unrelaying force here, I get my cooldown, I switch to bind, then the cooldown's gone. You see? The compass is cleared up, there is no cooldown there, and I can use my bind shout as much as I want. With no restrictions. Alright? If I switch back into Unrelenting Force, uh, that has a 15 second cooldown, and I have actually now intentionally allowed 15 seconds to pass, so it's ready again. But I'm gonna show you what happens if I don't. So I now have 15 seconds cooldown, I switch to Bind, the cooldown is gone, I switch back to Unre Unrelenting Force, the cooldown is back, okay? So you can't cheat with this system. The cooldown will remain in the background, it just won't be on your compass, because it allows uh, your bind shout to be used um, without restrictions instead. Where you will find the cooldown, however, if you are on bind and you want to know how much unrelenting force cooldown you have left, you can look at the top right corner, if you have sky UI, and that will show you the actual remaining cooldown of unrelenting force. There's also that sound that you just maybe heard. Uh, when your shout cooldown ends, you will get a specific sound effect that informs you that your normal vanilla shout cooldown is now ready, and you can use a new normal vanilla shout. Of course, if you are on your vanilla shout, if you haven't switched back to bind, then you won't get any sound effect, because then you already have the visual indicator on the compass, and that's enough. And you can switch back and forth as much as you want, and the cooldown will be tracked while that's happening. So yeah, it's pretty nice. In addition to this, there is a convenience feature for you. So bind, as stated, is such a central uh, mechanic to the mod that you pretty much always want it equipped. Unless you are actively using a different shout right now, you probably want your shout button to be bind. There's no reason for your shout button to be uh, equipped to unrelenting force when you're not using it. During these 15 seconds of cooldown, having a shout button that does nothing is useless, right? So that shout button may as well be equipped with bind during those 15 seconds. And there is a setting that allows this to happen automatically. So you can go into your configuration, either the book or the MCM menu, and you can turn on focus for shouts, and then you will get exactly this mechanic. So you equip on Relenting Force, you use it, and now you're back on bind automatically. I didn't have to do anything, it just switched back to bind for me, uh, and it's tracking the vanilla cooldown up in the top right corner. For Xbox users that don't have Sky UI and therefore don't have the tracking, you will still get the sound effect. You will still have that sound effect that indicates when it's ready, but you won't have the actual bar that's decreasing. There is nothing I can do about that, unfortunately. Uh, this is the best I can do for you. You can, of course, also, uh, if you have Unrelenting Force hotkeyed, say to three, <clears throat> and you're on bind, you can of course press three to check where your cooldown is at, and then switch back to bind uh, in between. If the cooldown wasn't ready, then switch back to bind and continue using that. The um, negative part of that, of course, is that you need a, shot, a hotkey for bind, right? If you have gone over here, you can't cast your Unrelenting Force, then you can't get back to bind. You're locked on Unrelenting Force now, so you need a hotkey to get back to bind. However, if you're using the uh, Power Autocast focus setting as well, the one that I just uh, showed you, the one that's over here, this one, if you're using this, then this one also re-equips bind, right? So what you can do 
potentially is that if you are over on the bind shout uh, for checking your cooldown on it if you have switched over there and are checking your cooldown and you the cooldown was still there so you can't cast it then you can use a power then you can use a power and that will switch you back to bind all right so that that's a tip for you xbox people specifically uh, right, let's continue onwards. Refocus. Refocus is a nice little feature of this mod. Refocus means that if you have a spell, let's say Thunderbolt, you cast that, you will automatically switch back to draw and ward. Nice. Uh, I will bind that to two. I can cast Thunderbolt, I'm back to draw. I can do some drawing in casting. I can switch back to Thunderbolt again with my hotkey and cast that again, and I will switch back to draw and ward. The tip here that I just wanted to mention is that you can spam cast. You don't have to just cast a once and then it will go back. Uh, if you want to empty your entire Magicka bar with this spell, then you can do that. Just keep spamming the spell and it won't switch back until you're done and then it will switch back so it waits a little bit after each cast to check if you're done casting and if you are it will switch back but otherwise it will keep that spell until you yourself choose to be done with it uh, moving on with the research book we have this setting uh, on bind and weapon binding, which allows you to uh, decide when the weapon should be summoned. Should it be summoned when you're holding both draw and ward spell, when you're holding one of them, or when you're holding anything. Anything means that you will never uh, get draw and ward from pressing bind. Press bind, you will get the weapon always. Uh, so the default is that you need both and with this setting uh, if I switch and equip Dawnbreaker here and then I press bind I will go back to Dawn Ward and then I need to bind again to get my bomb weapon. For spell blades, spell swords, however you want to uh, call them, the type of people that use weapons along with spells, this is a bit Im impractical. You want to probably go straight from your Dawnbreaker and Draw setup into your Bound Weapon setup. And doing this, and then this, and then going back like this, and then this, and then uh, this. That's a bit annoying. That's a bit annoying. That takes a while. So you don't want to do that. Luckily, the mod has you covered on this end. Uh, you can switch. So this is exactly what this setting is for. You go in here, you pick bind and weapon binding, and you choose draw, draw or ward. So you just need one of them to get your weapon. If you have it set to that, then you can have your Dawnbreaker equipped. Now when I press bind, I will go straight to my bound weapon. And I can do my discharge combos and all of that. And when I press bind again to go back, I will also auto re-equip Dawnbreaker, so I don't need to do that manually. So I greatly recommend you change that setting if you are playing a Spellblade character. Very important. Finally, the last thing I'm going to uh, mention about the research book is something with the imbue mechanic. So that's the one here. Uh, I'm gonna set this to imbue when reversing and interrupt power. If I now imbue myself by using reverse, I reverse hotkey to one here, then this is what happens, right? I get this little fiery effect and now I'm now imbued. And I can like power attack to ward myself from projectiles and magic and stuff. 
that's what he really does, along with some other stuff. I'm not going to go through all of the details. Anyway, what I wanted to say was that when you're doing this actual process, when you're drawing world and then pressing reverse to imbue world, not only are you imbuing yourself, you are also attuning yourself. And this can be pretty practical for situations where you want to do silent uh, attunement. So say that you are attuned to world, which I am now, I'm attuned to world, uh, but I'm walking around carrying the death spell. So let's, let's just check here so that you're all on the same track with me here. I'm attuned to world, but I'm holding death. Okay? And it's my attunement that decides which discharge I get. So if I'm heading into a fight, I want to open that fight with a death discharge, then I now have to attune myself to what I'm holding, right? And the normal way of doing that is casting the spell. If I cast death, then I will attune myself to death, and I can then summon my weapon and discharge death. But that makes noise. It makes a lot of noise. And if you're opening a fight from stealth, you don't want to attract attention. And that's when you can use imbue instead. Instead of releasing my spell here, I can press 1 to reverse, and then I will do a silent attunement, because imbuement doesn't make any noise. Imbuing yourself makes no noise. So now I am attuned to death, and no one has still noticed me, so now I can equip my bound weapon, which is also silent, and then I can go in and stab him in the back, and get my death discharge that I wanted. So I can freeze everyone and then keep stabbing people in the back while they're frozen, for example. So that's pretty practical for stealthy characters. Right, that's the research book done. Uh, I'm going to jump into binding. Binding is when you draw an element and then you press the bind button and then you get stuff like this. <laughs> the, um, what's it called? The weaving circle. I'm gonna move out of it, and it explodes. That's one of the binds. Another one is uh, if I draw from death, I put that down, I can put it down as a rune, and that rune can then detonate and freeze enemies. I can also draw life. Um, bind that. I will become invulnerable for a short time. Those are the bindings, right? These you know about. Uh, what I want to say first and foremost is that bindings do not damage allies. Alright? So when you face down a death rune, the empowered variant of the death rune, uh, and you detonate it, it won't do any damage to allies. It won't do any damage to you or any of your followers. It will only damage enemies. If you create a weaving circle and you blow that up, it will again not do damage to your allies. It will only do damage to enemies. It will knock allies back. I want them to mention that. It will knock allies back, but it won't cause damage to them. They also won't uh, get any aggro on you. You won't get any aggro on you. Uh, the explosions from these effects, the ones that knock back, they aren't attributed to you. So it won't cause your followers to start attacking you. So you are very safe when it comes to using your various uh, spell cycle combos among your followers. It won't cause you to uh, get in a fight with them. You, you can relax about that. The only things that do cause aggro on you is when you are actively shooting at your allies. Okay, so if you're using like drawn world here and you're shooting the fireball so that the explosion actually hits your allies, that will cause aggro. But these uh, big ass AOE effects that you have no real control over, that cover such a large area that they're pretty much guaranteed to hit one of your followers, those are filtered by the mod, so you don't have to worry. So that, that's basically the, uh, the idea behind it. So that, Areas that are so big that uh, you can't control if they hit your followers or not are designed in such a way that uh, it doesn't matter. 
they are filtered so that it doesn't matter if you hit your followers because they won't take damage anyway. So don't worry too much about using spell siphon in combination with followers, is what I'm saying. Speaking of the weaving circle, I also wanted to go through the technique in which you weave using the circle. Because this is hard. This is actually one of the hardest things in the entire mod to master. How to use this thing to effectively weave power. Because you all know how weaving works in the basic sense. You cast one element and then you draw a different element and then you cast that different element and you get woman power, right? You get one stack of woman power. And then you can draw one different element again, you can cast that, and you get another stack of woman power. The nice thing about the weaving circle is that you have another hand. You don't just have your draw hand, you have another hand in addition. And that allows you to weave three times as fast as normal. And the way you do this is that you draw so that you have different elements in each hand. You see I have death in one hand and world in the other right now. And then you cast your drawn element first. Okay? So world here is not my drawn element. That's the one I have in my off hand. The element that I last drew is death. In my draw hand, I have death. So you cast that first, and then you follow that up immediately with the other element. And you only have a half a second to do this, okay? So release death, immediately release world before it switches. That way you build two stacks of woman power, and now you can draw an element again, and you can repeat this process. Cast world first, and then death immediately after. Draw death, cast death first, and world immediately after. Okay, world first, death immediately after. This is the basics, okay? Start by practicing this. Then, on top of this, you want to layer one more cast that I haven't mentioned yet, and that is when you're drawing. So now I have death in my off hand, so now I should be drawing world, right? While I'm drawing world, I should be casting death, okay? So I draw world and cast death at the same time. And then I do what I said before. I cast my drawn element first, and then my off hand element. World death. And then I draw death while casting world. Cast death world. Draw world while casting death. Cast world death, draw death while casting world, cast death world, draw world while casting death, cast world death. This is the process. Repeat as many times as you have time to do. Like in, in the fight, as long as you can stay within the circle without getting attacked and without dying, then this is the fastest way to weave in the entire mode. This is extremely efficient in building power. But it takes some practice. It takes some practice to do this. And if you are using concentration spells as well, it gets even harder. Because then you need to juggle concentration in addition to uh, charge and release spells. And that makes it even harder. But yeah, for example, now I managed to build 15 woven power stacks with this which has multiplied my damage by three times. Just by doing this for a few seconds. So yeah, that's a big tip. This is, this is how you should weave with the weaving circle. This is the most efficient way to use this ability. Um, when you're done with circle, now I went into death overload because I drew death two times in a row. When you're done with the circle, you're getting attacked, you need to get away, then you usually detonate the circle, right? And that's the next thing I want to talk about. So now I am currently attuned to death. If I now detonate my circle by pressing bind, this, this is the empowered 
this is the empowered binding variant. It works the same way with the normal definition that you get at level one. So don't worry about that too much. There, there was a big flame pillar. It's the same mechanic, that you blow up the circle. When that happens, what I wanted to mention is that that attuned me. So detonating my circle attuned me to world. That means I got a woman power, right? I was attuned to death, now I'm attuned to world, I got a woman power. But I'm still holding world, uh, death. I'm still holding the element that I was holding in the circle. So I can immediately follow this up by casting death, and I will get yet another woman power. And I am now attuned to death. So when you're detonating the circle, try to be holding an element that isn't world. Because then you get uh, one woman power for detonating the circle, and then you can get another woman power immediately by using a spell after detonating the circle. Um, that's, that's all I'm going to say about the circle. I know that's advanced stuff, and that takes a while to master and even understand, but that's, that's what I'm going to say about that. Uh, the next binding I'm going to talk about is Death Binding. So Death Binding creates a rune. And uh, the additional thing I want to mention about that is that when you're placing the rune, <clears throat> you should be trying to let the rune sit for a little bit. Placing it directly at your uh, enemy's feet so that it detonates immediately is not an efficient way to use this ability. It is designed so that you will be rewarded for placing it like a trap, keeping it there for a little while, and then bringing your enemies onto it so that it triggers after a little while. This is most apparent when you get the empowered variant because the empowered rune uh, requires charge up time and will won't do its full effect unless it's charged up. But even the weak variant, even the weak death room has this mechanic that is much better to let, leave it uh, sitting for a bit. And I'm going to explain why. <clears throat> and the reason is that uh, when you're casting the death room, you are going to get attuned to death. Because that's how bindings work. When you do a binding, you always get attuned to the bound element. So say I was attuned to death. And then I do a death binding. Um, and now I'm attuned to death. Right? I was attuned to world. I drew death and I bound it. And now I'm attuned to death. If I now detonate this rune immediately, it will do its blast wave. And that blast wave will attune me to death. Right? Because that's what the blast wave does. So I was attuned to death already. And now the blast wave attuned me to death. Yeah, that means I wasted woman power. That attunement could have given me woman power if I was attuned to something else, but it didn't, because I'm already attuned to death. So the correct way of using this is to attune yourself to world, for example, draw death, place the room to attune yourself to death, and then let it sit there while you again attune yourself to a different element and then detonate the room, getting yourself attuned back to death and getting an additional woman power. All right, you see the difference? So the intention is always to let the rune sit for at least one draw cycle where you attune yourself to another element before you detonate the room. Otherwise, you're wasting woven power, and that's not good <laughs> for your overall damage efficiency. Right, let's move on to Discharge. Discharge, I'm not gonna say a whole lot about this. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about the cooldown system, actually. So Discharge is when you summon a weapon and you hit with it, and that causes a certain magical effect to occur. Right, this one you know about. I'm gonna go ahead and summon a wolf here. That's when I hit my wolf with this. We get this big ice storm, and the wolf gets frozen. Right? This is a discharge. You're all familiar with discharges. Um, 
what happens when I do that is that I get a cooldown, right? I get a cooldown here called Shaping Disturbance for 60 seconds. That means that my first charge of uh, discharge <laughs> has been consumed. Uh, one of my cooldowns, one of my discharge cooldowns is now consumed. And I need to wait a minute before I get it back. However, I have two charges. So I can grab some Whirl here. And I can discharge that. And I get yet another discharge effect. Right? I, I was on cooldown. Uh, but I could still do another discharge because I had another charge in that cooldown. This kind of char charge system you may be familiar with if you have played MMO games. Otherwise, you probably haven't seen this kind of cooldown before. Uh, but it's it's popular in, for example, Final Fantasy XIV, which has this charge system for several abilities. But basically, it means that uh, you have two two repetitions of this, and when the first charge finishes its cooldown, the second charge is allowed to start counting down. So you don't have two parallel cooldowns. That, that's a big difference. Because if you just had two parallel cooldowns, then you could use them both back to back immediately, and then they would both be counting down at the same time. Like, there, there's 60 seconds would both be counting down. And then when 60 seconds have passed, you would get both of your cooldowns back. Right? That's how it, how it works. This system, however, doesn't work like that. Because the second cooldown is not allowed to start counting down until the first is done. Okay? And that's an important dif difference. <clears throat> and what this means in practice is that there is no actual reason for you to use your both of your cooldowns immediately. It is exactly as efficient cooldown-wise, <laughs> efficiency-wise, it is exactly as efficient for you to use them back-to-back -back as it is for you to use one, wait 55 seconds, and then use the other one. You won't waste any kind of cooldown time doing this. You have the full minute of cooldown time to use your second charge, and it will still take as much time for you to get both of your charges back. Just keep that in mind. There, there's no need for you to waste both of your discharges immediately. The intention of the mod is to, for you to use the discharges tactically when the situation calls for it. Um, and that's why the system is designed in this way. So you have this ability to use both of your charges immediately if the situation calls for it, or just use one and then save the other one for a better situation. And you're not getting punished for either option. If that got confusing, just take some time to process it in your head. I'm sure it will make sense after a while. Uh, empowered binding, then. Uh, the, that's what's called binding to this one. That's when your bindings get some additional uh, effects. To them. And on that subject, I just wanted to say that the life bind, the life bind ability, is very practical for traversal. Uh, a lot of people probably know this, but ethereal form in this game prevents fall damage. So if you are on top of a mountain and you want to jump down, then one way to do that is to draw life from something, bind that life, and then make the jump. That way you will take zero fall damage because you're invulnerable. It's pretty practical. Uh, the other thing I want to say about Empowered Bindings is that when their cooldowns are counting down, and you can see those in the top right corner, if you have Sky UI, you're gonna get all of them rolling here. So now in the top right corner, you can see a lightning symbol, an ice symbol, and a fire symbol. Those are your three cooldowns for life, death, and world. When those reach zero, there is a individual special sound that is heard for each one. And the intention here is for Xbox users specifically, but also PC users, to get an indication that this cooldown is now ready. Now you can use it again. And I'm just gonna demo these three sounds here so that you can see them, uh, so that you can hear them once. So first we're gonna hear the life cooldown expiration sound.
then we're gonna hear the death expiration. And finally, the world expiration. <laughs> the additional explosion there was just because the anima uh, died. So that wasn't part of the sound. But yeah, uh, so they all have this unique effect to them. And of course, in the middle of combat, this can sometimes be hard to distinguish from other sounds happening. But at least it's an additional aid for you to uh, keep track of when your cooldowns are ready or not. Right, last on walkbook, animation. And this is the big one. <laughs> this is where I have quite a lot to go, to go through, actually. Um, so animation is the act of creating anima, which is spell siphons, variants of Atronox that work in their own little special ways. Um, I'm going to start with the life anima. So when you uh, bind life, and again, get out my nice little life source. When you bind life, you go into this ethereal form, and when you break out of it, you get a life anima. And it has this little aura around it. And that aura causes you to get this healing effect, right? You can see that on my character. Uh, what I wanted to mention there is that the healing effect also regenerates your magicka. And the tutorial, tutorial does mention this, but I just wanted to say specifically here that the intention here is for the life anima to not only be a defensive tool for healing yourself up, but also an offensive tool, kind of a totemic focus for your spells. So when you're summoning the life anima, your tactic should usually be to switch to an external spell, like lightning bolt, and then spam that while you're having the your magicka regenerated by the anima. Because your magicka is really quickly getting fueled back up. So it will be a big waste to not make use of that. In addition to that, the life bind itself also has a magicka regeneration mechanic. When you end the life uh, bind form, the ethereal form from the life bind, Um, you're also getting Magicka. So you're getting a big boost of Magicka from the beginning, and then while the life anima is beside you, you're getting Magicka all the time. So during this entire period, you should focus on spamming as much spells as possible so you don't overcap your Magicka reserves. So let me demo this. Step one, you spend your Magicka to get your drain down to zero. And then you draw a life, you bind that, and you get this big boost back up to max. You switch back to your external spell, and you start spamming away that magic out while your anima is regenerating it. So that's that's pretty much the intended gameplay here. You use your magic out for offense. Of course, if you need the anima for defense, then this is not the best way to do it. Uh, then you should focus around getting your healing back and maybe using that magic to heal yourself instead. But I want, as a design, I want every ability in this mod to be both uh, offensively and defensively useful. So that's why it's de designed in this way. So that can, you can use it in both ways. For the world anima, I just wanted to mention that it's stationary, right? It works like a turret, it stays in one point, point and it will fire uh, its spells at your enemies. However, sometimes you may want to relocate it for in order for it to like aim around the corner, or maybe you want to place your fusion at a different location. I just wanted to mention that spells like Oblivion Rift will work on your anima. So you can use that to summon it to a new location. And that will help you get more value out of it. Instead of just leaving it there on the other side of the corner where it couldn't hit anything. So this kind of external spell, Oblivion Rift, is very useful in combination with spell siphon. Uh, speaking of fusion, that is the last part of this tips and tricks video. And this is a biggie. So first, let's go through the world fusion. 
So I wanted to stake first that World Fusion is the highest damaging ability in the entire mod. When it comes to like pure complete damage, the World Fusion, however, takes 20 seconds to deal its damage. So it only becomes this most powerful ability if you let it tick for its entire 20 second duration. It is not the highest instant damage, that's light discharge, but it's, it's the highest value ability. So whenever you have an anima up and you know that this fight is going to go on for more than 20 seconds, you should aim to get your world fusion debuff, the burning debuff, applied to as many enemies as possible. Um, also, the world fusion detonates when people die, right? If they are under the world fusion effect, if they are burning and they are killed, then they will detonate. And that detonation will damage everyone around them and it will also spread the world fusion burn. So that's another reason to apply it early in the fight when you know the fight is going to go on for a while. Because you get both a lot of burn damage and you get a lot of detonation damage when things start to die. Um, the burn does not stack, however. The, the burn is, uh, it will refresh its duration, but it will not stack to higher magnitudes. So getting lots of detonation at the same time uh, from several things dying doesn't mean that the things that surround them now are burning like five, six stacks simultaneously because then they would just pretty much die immediately from all of that burn damage. So to keep the balance a bit fair here, uh, the, the damage over time effect does not stack. It will refresh, but it won't stack. However, the explosion, each detonation explosion will do some instant damage as well. It does a bit of fired instant damage in addition to the burn. So getting lots of chain detonations in this small tightly packed area with a lot of enemies is still very efficient. It's very good to do. I'm just saying it won't have overpowered effects like stacking 10 burns on enemies and making them die immediately. Uh, it also means that there is no reason for you to detonate several anima in a row with world. No reason, because you will just get multiple burn stacks and that won't be efficient. It will be more efficient for you to do one world fusion to get the burn spread out and then use world and death fusion to get more efficiency out of your remaining anima. Uh, world Fusion detonations will also affect allies, or rather, uh, it won't damage allies, because again, this is one of those kinds of detonations that you can't really control the placement of. They, they kind of happen all over the place when things are dying. So your allies are pretty much guaranteed to get hit by them. And because of that, the mod will filter their damage so that your allies do not get damaged. However, your allies will get primed and when I say primed, I mean that when that ally then dies, they will explode and spread the burn effect. So uh, this is mostly for like necromancer type of characters where you summon up lots of like undead skeevers or something or skeletons, l like a large army of weak allies. Then world fusion is perfect for that situation because you can spread the priming effect onto all of your weak targets and then when those go into battle and die like the cannon fodder they are, they will each explode and cause world fusion burns to surrounding enemies. So that's a, that's a really good tactic for uh, necromancer style characters. Uh, world fusion finally also has a firewall. And you probably saw that right here. When I fuse world, I get this firewall on the ground like this. And that does apply the burn effect, but it also staggers enemies. So this is this is a type of control. This will keep you safe. So if your enemies are on one side of the wall and you are on the other side, and you have a bit of breathing room where you can uh, like prepare a big spell, for example. All right, so I'm going to create an army of Draugr here to attack me, like so. <laughs> 
And then I'm going to create an anima because I need something to detonate. Actually, I'm going to reanimate something. So I have something to detonate. Then I'm going to draw a world and I'm going to do the world fusion. Do that here. That creates the firewall. Then I'm going to stand behind the firewall. <laughs> okay, apparently this army is too weak for World Fusion. Keep in mind, World Fusion is a level 70 ability, and I'm spawning level 1 draugers. So this, this is a bit my fault. Let's find a draugger that has a little bit more health, a little bit more resilience, and we can use that as, instead. So we'll use a draugger thrall, maybe. Um, let's just jump up to the zero zeros. Uh, draugger scourge, let's, let's pick one of those. Okay, seriously now, <laughs> let me demonstrate this. So, we will first create an army of we will first create an army of scourge like so. Here we have our army of scourges, and then we will form an anima. We'll let them shout a bit first. We'll create an anima, and then we will fuse that anima with fire. And then we will hide behind the firewall we created and start charging up our ritual spell. And then, there we go. Pretty nice, right? The firewall kept them at bay while I charged up my ritual spell, and then you could just kill them all. Moving on then to life fusion. So, life fusion. Uh, is an excellent follow-up to World uh, Flame Strike. So when you're uh, when you have a weaving circle and you use Flame Strike, uh, it knocks all of the nearby enemies away. Life Fusion is a practical way to get them back in the group if you want to follow it up with aerial effect attacks of various kinds. So I'm gonna spawn a few more draugers here, like so. If I now have my weaving circle here. And I use and I draw some life first. Let's start by drawing life. So I have life in hand. And then I detonate the circle. That knocks everyone away, right? So now they're spread out and I can't use AoE attacks on them anymore. So then I follow it up with life fusion. And that gathers everyone up again in a nice little pile so that you can keep using your area of effect spells. That's practical. Okay, so also on the topic of life fusion, uh, if you have wall spells of various kinds, like incendiary flow from apocalypse that does these kinds of things, they create burning ground, for example, so if enemies stand in it, they take a lot of damage. If you have these kinds of spells, they work perfectly with the life fusion. So if I have a few draugers here, I'm gonna pull in a few more of these draugers scourges. And I'm gonna create an anima that I can use. Then I can pull them in a nice little pile and I can equip my incendiary flow and draw just throw that through the pile and while they're getting up they're taking a ton of damage they're both gathered up which is perfect for this tight area and they're stationary because they're knocked down which is also perfect for this kind of spell this is also an extremely powerful combo um, moving on then to Death Fusion. Death Fusion is the one where you can convert your anima into a death anima. So if I have a life one here, I can draw some death, 
shoot it through the world anima. And it will become a death anima. The downside of the death anima is that it only lasts for 15 seconds and then it will self implode. Uh, the upside is that it's more durable. It has a lot more health uh, than the world anima has. Uh, and there's some other advantages that I'm gonna get to. So, um, basically, the death anima is something you should use on everything before it dies. So if you have a life anima, let's say, say you have a life anima, we're gonna create one of those. Then it will first do its aura, right? Where it's healing you and generating magicka. That's super useful, very good. Use that. But then the aura ends. Now you just have a stationary, completely useless thing, right? The only reason for this to exist now is for you to fuse it with something. And if you fuse it directly with life or world, then you will get those fusion effects and that's great. But if you fuse it with death first, then you first have 15 seconds of a powerful ally, and then you can fuse that anima, the death anima, with world or life. So you're getting double value. You're still getting the world and life fusion that you would have gotten if you did that immediately, but instead of just doing that, you now got 15 seconds of a big lumbering death anima uh, to help you out. It's much better to always fuse with death first, uh, and then fuse with world or life when the death anima is about to die. And that also brings me on to the second fact that when the death anima is about to die, it has a visual warning, a visual and auditory, auditory warning for that. So it lasts 15 seconds, and when those 15 seconds are almost over, you will hear a crackling sound and you will get a little mist effect around it, warning you, like this. And then it explodes. So as soon as you see that little frost aura, the little frost, frost cloak surrounding it, that's a cue for you to fuse the anima before it's too late. If it just explodes on its own, then you have wasted a fusion, and that's of course not good. So, so try to keep an eye on that and fuse them before it's too late. Uh, death anima is also a perfect way to increase the value of weak uh, corpses. So if you have like skeevers in high level dungeons, they tend to pop up a little everywhere. Uh, if you have a skeever in a high level dungeon, then that skeever is pretty much useless, right? You can resurrect it, but it will die from one hit. That's, that's pretty useless. But with death fusion, you can actually get a lot of use out of it. So let's say that this stronger here, this is stronger Scourge. Let's go back to our old level one simple draugers, if we still have any. Oh, oh, I guess those got blown away somewhere. Let's imagine that this stronger Scourge is a level one draugger. And you can use the life from your wolf to reanimate that one. And then immediately, when it stands up, fuse it with death. And that level one useless ally has now become a powerful, equal leveled death animal that can actually serve a purpose in a high level dungeon. Along with becoming fusion fodder, of course. So you can follow it up with life or world fusion before it dies. Uh, when you're doing this type of action, uh, you should also keep in mind a practical thing, and that is while someone is standing up from a reanimation, they are still a source of death. So, yeah, I can add, reanimate this one, and then while it's standing up, I can draw death from it, so that I am ready that when it finishes standing up, I can immediately throw away that death and get the death animal. So if you want to do this conversion from a low value enemy into a high value death anima, then this is one of the most 
quick and easy ways to do it. Uh, and that's it. That's it. That's my entire list of tips and tricks for now. There is, of course, a lot more that one could talk about. About this mod. There, there's, there's a lot of mechanics. There's a lot of mechanics, and they all have interactions of various kinds. And when you start involving other mobs with other spells, the interactions become exponentially larger. So I can't go through everything, of course. But this will be my first video video on this. Uh, we'll see if I make any more in the future. I'm not going to make any promises on that front. But I hope you enjoyed this little showcase of uh, what you can do with Spell Siphon in its current iteration. Let me know in the comments uh, if there were any questions or, again, if you have any tips or tricks that you have discovered over your time of using the mod. Please share both with me and with your with the other players that are here and watching this video. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear from you in in all kinds of ways, <laughs> both feedback on the video and uh, feedback on the mod, of course, and feedback on your own use cases for the mod. But that's it for me. Uh, so I'm just gonna wish you all good luck with the mod and have fun and. I will see you around.